Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Brew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today it is me and I want to talk about 12 ways that a psychological approach can support you on your journey in eating disorder recovery. Now I know many people perhaps feel quite dubious about accessing therapy, whether it's going to be helpful to them, they sometimes wonder should I just do it on my own and maybe your eating disorder feels quite entrenched as part of your identity you're really scared about losing it it's almost like this kind of friend or life raft that you're clinging to maybe as well you've got lots of fears about change and feel anxious about considering a life without it so you might wonder as well how can anyone possibly help you untangle your complicated relationship with food when you have an eating disorder and I think all of these are very real and common anxieties when you're thinking about having therapy or getting help so If you're dubious about therapy, and perhaps you're not wanting to invest financially in weekly sessions, you might be interested to access support via an online course. Now, I think as well, personally, it's not a replacement necessarily for one-to-one individual support. I think nothing perhaps beats ideally being in the room with someone, but um, nowadays it's often, isn't it, on Zoom. I know that definitely is for me, for most of my clients. But you can still gain a lot of awareness, self-understanding, and to begin to navigate skills and strategies to support yourself via an online course through other means. And I know for myself that online learning has been incredibly helpful for me in my ongoing personal development. Now, obviously, I've been recovered from bulimia now for many, many years, but I've had ongoing issues with people-pleasing, finding my voice, communication, setting boundaries, self-validation, And I have learned a ton of stuff online via online courses, just watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts. And I think it's not a substitute for meeting with another human being, but you can get so much value from this. So what I want to let you know is that I'm in the process of creating two courses at the moment, one to focus on bulimia recovery and one on binge eating disorder recovery. And these are going to be two courses that are 12 modules. They're going to be self-paced, video content and worksheets to complete. And I'm bringing my experience of supporting many clients over the past 20 years. And of course, my lived experience of bulimia and recovering, recovering fully. So I'm going to put all my tips and tricks and understanding and awareness and personal experience and everything I can in these courses to make them available to you. And um, yeah, I am hoping that for many people listening, they could be an accompaniment to therapy or they could be an alternative to therapy if maybe now is not the right time for you to be engaging in therapy, you know, or a compliment or I guess however you want to use them. And I think there is no one thing fits all, fixes all in our recovery journeys, but I think all of these kind of tools and additional things can be incredibly helpful. So I am currently about a third of the way through producing these courses. So if you're interested in either the bulimia one or the binge eating one, do send me a DM on Instagram. That's at the eating disorder therapist underscore, or send me an email at harrietfrew.gmail.com and you can go on the waiting list because I'm gonna do some like good discounts for anyone that gets like early bird um, offers. And um, yeah, if you'd be interested in that, do let me know because the full price for each course is going to be something like really reasonable, like about £99. But I am probably going to be running, well, I'm definitely going to be running like a 20% introductory discount code. So, and I hope the courses are going to be fully live within a few weeks. So do get in touch if you're interested though, and you want to go on the waiting list. So either DM me on Instagram or email me harriet.fruit at gmail.com. So I'm going to talk about 12 ways that therapy, psychological support can help you in overcoming an eating disorder. And this is just going to give you as well a little glimmer and insight into some of the information that's going to be in the courses. So if this resonates with you, then you may want to um, get your name on the wait list and to sign up. Um, And if it doesn't, it doesn't, you will kind of get this info free of charge and it, you know, hopefully you can make some use of it in some way. 
Okay, so number one, understanding why you have an eating disorder and also exploring your ambivalence around change. So I guess when we develop an eating disorder, it is often an unconscious coping strategy for different things that have been going on in our lives. And there are many sort of predisposing factors you know, from very young in our lives, we've probably grown up in diet culture, we may have experienced weight stigma, fat phobia, we may have had comments about our weight, we may have had parents who dieted, we may have had things going on in the home, maybe big T trauma where you experienced abuse or neglect, or maybe more the little T traumas where your emotional needs were consistently overlooked, or maybe a combination of the two. And as I've said before many times on this podcast, is that I think our parents, our grandparents, they are doing the best they can at the time with the knowledge that they have. Many previous generations just did not get a look in with their mental health. They had no support. They were very much just left to get on with it by themselves. So often our parents and our grandparents didn't have their own emotions validated. They were just surviving and getting on with things. So they can only do the best that they can, but it's meant that often, you know, when we've been growing up in our homes, often our emotional needs haven't been met fully, even if we felt that we were loved and our physical needs were met. So it's really important to like go back and look at some of our earliest needs because underneath an eating disorder are usually some feelings of not feeling good enough, feeling in some way perhaps that um, we weren't seen or we had to sort of show up in a certain way to be kind of validated and for whatever reason we are often left not feeling good enough. So it can be so helpful to really try and understand the roots of that eating disorder and you're not feeling good enough. And then I guess there can be numerous other things that can, can contribute because if you're not feeling good enough, particularly when you hit the teen years, you are massively vulnerable as you're exposed to diet culture to wanting to get thinner or change your body, change how you look as a way to gain self-esteem, to gain a sense of identity, to gain a sense of approval from others. And we do live in a society which sadly does validate you and accept you a lot more if you are in a smaller body. So it's no wonder that many people start dieting as a teenager, starting to perhaps restrict their eating, falling into disordered eating patterns. And then it's quite hard to kind of heal your relationship with food once you're in these disruptive cycles. So I think the past becomes less relevant once we actually are unstuck in the kind of um, perpetuating cycles of an eating disorder, because of for anyone, if you are restricting, um, you are likely to binge eat, you are likely to fall into purging, you're more at risk of over-exercising, you get caught in this really, really difficult loop, and then your self-worth has become so connected to your weight, your ability to follow a certain meal plan, etc it's really, really, really hard to win at. So it's so helpful as part of healing from an eating disorder to really be able to go deep and to understand what has led you to this point. And maybe you will need to sort of process some trauma if that is relevant for you in your past and you will need to kind of find a way of doing that. Just come into terms really with what happened or what didn't happen for you as you were growing up. And you know, releasing some of those feelings getting in touch with that little child within you, you know, that didn't always get their needs met and being able to offer yourself compassion and understanding and to make sense of it all really, putting the pieces of the jigsaw together. So that is such a helpful piece of work, okay? And then off the back of that, what's really helpful to understand is how the eating disorder is serving you. What are the positives? What are the negatives of the eating disorder? Because of an eating disorder is a coping strategy. It is never something I think that someone consciously decides to use to cope, but it becomes a way to feel better, to find a sense of peace, a sense of control, a life raft to cling to, something that's safe, a way to distract and numb from difficult emotions, a way of communicating to others. And we often have a lot of costs as well around living with an eating disorder, multiple costs to our social, physical, emotional, mental health, all the different aspects. But those pros, the things we're getting from the eating disorder are often very, very powerful. So it's massively important to understand this.
So it is incredibly likely that you might feel in two minds about change. One part of you desperately wants to move on and let go of a destructive relationship with food and your body. However, another part of you just can't. And this can feel really confusing as your feelings about the eating disorder might vary day by day or hour by hour. And sometimes you might think, actually, maybe I don't have a problem after all. Maybe these rules and things are just keeping me safe. And other times you might think, oh, I'm so fed up with this. I've just had enough. I want out. I need help now. So it's so helpful to explore your ambivalence and recognize what the eating disorder really means to you. So maybe it is a way of coping with difficult feelings. Maybe it's a way of trying to control your weight. Maybe it's deeply familiar and offers safety and reassurance. So by working through this, you can gain greater understanding about your ambivalence. And this can then be a powerful building block for potential change going forward because of unless you're really honest with yourself about how the eating disorder is helping you cope, it is very hard to get motivated about change and it's very hard to have a different relationship towards your eating disorder because yes, it's helping you cope, but actually in maladaptive and unhelpful ways. And fundamentally, you don't want to be, well, I don't think you do, you don't want to be like escaping your emotions through starving. You don't want to probably have an identity that's so linked to your body size. You probably want to have a full and flourishing life where you feel that you are living your purpose and your passion and living a life aligned with your truest values and having healthy relationships, not being tied up with food and rules and the number on the scales and all of those things. But it's so important to be so compassionate with yourself about your ambivalence and eating disorder is a coping strategy. You can't just kind of tell yourself off and tell yourself to pull yourself together and for goodness sake, just start eating and stop binging and just get on with it because it is a coping strategy, okay? It's probably not one that you chose. It may be one that you fell into and you may have not even realized in the beginning that it was somehow helping you cope, but it's probably been a life raft, something that has kept you safe through difficult times and you have now developed an attachment to it. It's an unhealthy attachment, but it also feels familiar. And as human beings, we do not like things that are unfamiliar. We're very wired to be drawn to things that are safe and predictable, and we don't really like change. And I guess, you know, as humans, this probably enabled us in many ways to survive, you know, not to kind of take too many kind of big risks or step out of our comfort zone. But actually, just because something is familiar and safe does not mean that it's right. So exploring your ambivalence can be incredibly helpful. And thinking back, as I've said in this podcast many times before, but if you're thinking about the end of your life, looking back on your life and what's important to you, how important is controlling food and your body going to really be in the bigger perspective of things? Because it's always hard to think about change when thinking about the next meal or next week or tomorrow but actually when we start to think about the longer term consequences of living with an eating disorder and the longer term grief and losses of missing out on so many things that can really help you move towards a more powerful point of change okay number two developing a different relationship with your eating disorder by unraveling diet culture and your values so From the moment that you're born, particularly if you live in Western culture, you have been indoctrinated with a lot of messages around how you should look, how your body should look. And this, these messages are continually sort of um, sent home to us on social media, on the television, by the bodies represented. You know, we're living in a culture where everyone's always harping on about dieting. There's a lot of pressure. We live in a very visual culture and people do get a lot of validation for how they look. So we are indoctrinated with all these messages. And I think we have lost sight sometimes as well of what it actually means to be so truly, truly healthy. Thinness has become very equated with health when actually, you know, that is not necessarily a kind of black and white relationship. Our health is about a whole load of other things that we've seen from the health and every size movement. That actually health behaviors are a much better indicator of health rather than just being thin. So things like behaviors like getting enough sleep, being hydrated, eating kind of healthily for your body but not in a restrictive way having good relationships all these things and there's so much research as well that's been done that you know when you look at centenarians people that live to 100 
So often what is really keeping them alive for such a long time is their sense of community, their sense of purpose, their deep relationships, having meaning in life. You know, they're not following very restrictive meal plans. They are usually eating quite a range of things. They're not overeating, they're not undereating. They're often being quite active, but not in a kind of punishing Western culture type way. They are just kind of going about their daily tasks and they are moving, but the connection piece is the most important. And in our Western culture, we have tended to reduce health to be all about exercise and what you eat. And we've become almost so obsessed about this that actually it's created so much anxiety around it that we're actually we're not healthy because we're worrying about it all too much. So it's all quite ironic really, isn't it? But I think what's very hard to do is to do a zoom out from all of this because we're living in the culture day by day. A lot of these messages are regularly reinforced. We are seeing stuff on social media. People are talking about all this stuff around us all the time. So it's really hard to step out of the echo chamber and to start to think about things differently. But what's really important in eating disorder recovery is about developing a different relationship with your eating disorder to realize actually this pursuit of thin that I have been doing to the detriment of my body is actually not healthy. You know, I can still pursue health, I can still move my body, I can still perhaps value my appearance and how I look, but if I am chasing thinness or a number on the scales in an obsessive way, I'm depriving myself of things, I'm actually making myself miserable and mentally and physically unhealthy, that is not health. So, Sometimes we have to go through a whole kind of re-education progress process in eating disorder recovery. And it's really hard because it's almost like changing your religion or something when you have been following a certain set of beliefs and a way of looking at the world for a very long time. It's almost like throwing everything that you have known on its head and starting to challenge it and look at it in a different way. And this is really, really, really hard to begin with. However, I know for myself, particularly even in the last few years. I mean, I've been recovered from an eating disorder for a very long time now, but I know that actually my positive engagement on social media, looking at intuitive eating and health at every size and a much greater representation of different bodies, etc., has really shifted how I address these whole, all of these issues and it has really shifted my perspective and I'm definitely in a more physically and mentally healthy place just from access to this information and shifting away from the old paradigm of kind of thin is the you know the way to go so really important to develop a different relationship with your eating disorder to recognize actually i've had my eating disorder sunglasses on as christopher fairburn professor christopher fairburn from oxford would say he says that when you have your eating disorder sunglasses on you're looking at the world in a very distorted way you're kind of you're looking at the world through the lens of comparing bodies, judging your food, you're very preoccupied with all of this, you're kind of in this vacuum really, and you are ignoring so many other things that are going on in the world, and actually your perspective is very distorted, even though it feels very normal. So Fairburn talks about the fact that you can take your sunglasses off, you can look at the world in a different way, and again, this is hard, and I think I like to think about diluting those sunglasses sometimes, like by reducing the tint of them, because if if you've been wearing eating disorder sunglasses for many, many years, taking them off probably just feels like completely unrealistic and might just feel too much of a leap, but actually you can start to reduce the tint on those sunglasses. And actually when we start to reduce the tint on those sunglasses, it expands our awareness for other things in life, okay? So if you've been so focused on food and body and all of the stuff, Actually, when you start to move towards healing, when you start to look at things in a different way, you can start to realize, actually, there's so many other things out in the world that I could be channeling my energy towards. You know, maybe the relationships or travel or purpose or education or studying or a job, other things that can really light you up and bring you so much more, um, just excitement and purpose and contentment, way more than an eating disorder can ever do, because an eating disorder often promises a lot, but actually it does not deliver, okay? Who has really found complete nirvana, peace and happiness from the pursuit of weight loss? Usually it ends up with a whole myriad of other problems. And as part of this, it's about really connecting with our deepest values, so starting to think about what is really, really important to me, Okay, and I know for myself, things like freedom, 
things like um, adventure, things like playfulness, things like connection and love are just way more important than some of the values that are aligned with the eating disorder. So it's so, so, so helpful to get really in touch with these, to get in touch with your deepest values. And then this can really shift you towards a much deeper place where you can think about change. Because of when you're just thinking about the more kind of superficial things, it can be really, really hard to interrupt that. So number three, regular eating and stabilizing blood sugar. Now, as you know, these are things that I am very, very passionate about. I think it is quite challenging to work on the psychological aspects of your eating disorder when your body physiology is all over the place. So regular eating, what we are looking to do with that is to aim to eat every two to three hours having three meals and three snacks per day. And if you're a long way from that at the moment, it doesn't matter. You just start where you are at and you just start to build some regularity, some structure, and that will just really help you develop a much secure base to be able to kind of make other progress from. Because when we are going long periods without eating, when we're not looking after ourselves, we're gonna be feeling tired, weary, have poor concentration, be feeling cold all the time, not being able to really engage in life, and then you'll be much more irritable, lose your sense of humor, really hard to connect with people. So this nutritional piece is really, really important. And of course, like stabilizing blood sugar as well. So if you're eating like a whole range of different foods or the macronutrients, so eating proteins, eating carbohydrates, eating good fats, eating your fruit and vegetables, and also slowly beginning to reintroduce your old forbidden foods. So really, really important because if you're having a balance of food groups as well, it's gonna be really, really helpful, particularly for someone that struggles with something like binge eating because having that stable blood physiology will really help you feel so much more stable in your mood, you will have more energy, and psychologically, you will feel a lot more emotionally resilient to deal with everything. But just as I said, really start with where you're at. And if you just feel that this just feels so overwhelming and out of reach for you at the moment, you might want to meet with an eating disorder nutritionist or dietitian and get a bit of help just for a couple of sessions you know to support you with a meal plan if you feel that would be helpful now i know for a lot of people actually if they were supporting someone else they would be able to write a meal plan and make healthy suggestions for that person to be able to eat like a good kind of balance of different foods and have a whole range of things and they will probably be fairly tuned in to portion sizes as well so I think sometimes we can get caught in the fantasy of thinking I need the perfect meal plan where actually we do kind of know what we would do for someone else but the tricky thing is it's hard to do it for ourselves so that's okay and if you recognize yourself here be really compassionate with yourself start with where you're at and you can make some baby steps from there Okay, number four, dealing with compensatory behaviors. So these can be things like um, purging through self-induced vomiting, it could be chewing and spitting, it could be over-exercise, or it could be laxatives. So I guess for each of these, there's gonna be a slightly different way that you're going to approach these. I think what's always really helpful to begin with is often we think our compensatory strategies are good, in inverted commas, we think that they are safe and reliable and we feel very reluctant to give them up. But I guess what's really helpful is to start to identify what are the costs of these compensatory strategies because maybe you can identify the pros, maybe you feel that they keep you safe within your eating disorder, maybe they give you the illusion of managing your weight. But actually for many of these things, things like purging, you know, through self-induced vomiting, that can be massively damaging for your teeth enamel, for your digestive system. You're much more likely to be suffering from low potassium, which can you know, bring about kind of muscle cramps, tingling in your limbs, can affect your heart conductivity, not healthy. Chewing and spitting, massively unhelpful again for your teeth and also your digestive system. A lot of people that chew and spit will have really bad IBS problems. Over-exercise, if you are sort of wedded to having to exercise when you are already weary and tired, you're probably gonna find that your immune system is massively affected, that you're always getting injuries, that you feel exercise has become a slog, that you have lost all your enjoyment from it. 
and that's not a great place to be in. So it's really helpful to get in touch with some of the negative aspects of the compensatory behaviors as an initial step, because then you can actually develop a kind of like a key awareness of how you're really feeling about these. And you may have been in a bit of an avoidant place and not really tuning in to the impact on your body. And that can be sometimes a way as kind of develop some motivation for change. And then I think with addressing some of the compensatory strategies, sometimes as well, this can be done through a sort of behavioral way of working. So say, for example, if you're purging so many times a week, you might want to think about how could you reduce that initially? If you're over-exercising, you might start to think about how could you reduce your number of steps or your number of visits to the gym. If you're taking lots of laxatives, again, you could start to reduce that in a stepped approach. And I think when dealing with these behaviors as well, it's really helpful to engage with the long game because of you've probably taken a while to develop these compensatory strategies. So it's probably gonna take some time maybe to come out the other side of them. And sometimes a more gentle weaning off process can be helpful rather than going cold turkey. But I think it's up to you. <laughs> There's not like a right and wrong way of doing it. But actually once you start to interrupt some of these cycles that involve the compensatory strategies, it can really help you get in a much better place with food. You'll be feeling physically a lot better and your blood physiology won't be all over the place either. Okay, number five, dealing with your emotions. So I think anyone that struggles with an eating disorder is probably quite disconnected from their body. So you are not only out of touch with your hunger and fullness, but you're also very out of touch with how you feel. And maybe you have never been madly in touch with your emotions. Maybe you've always been a bit disconnected. And I think, I'm thinking particularly cats in British culture, we have been very brought up, particularly in the past, to have the British stiff upper lip, to say everything's fine, not to talk about how we feel. And expressing emotions as often seen as a sign of weakness back in the day. Now, of course, people like Brené Brown have blown that out of the water. We now know that actually being vulnerable, being open with our emotions is actually really, really healthy and it's actually a real strength. And, you know, with all Brené's research, she has shown that actually that a lot of the people that are really, really vulnerable are some of the most successful in life. So, if you have an eating disorder, you are probably avoiding or numbing your emotions consciously or unconsciously. So as we begin to interrupt those behaviors, actually start to reduce some of those compensatory strategies, the restriction, the binging, whatever it is you're doing, it actually gives you a chance to connect more with yourself, to connect more with your body and to start to notice more how you're feeling. And sometimes this will really take some time. Um, you might not have a very wide emotional vocabulary. You might literally say that you are good or bad or fine. You may not really have ever explored all the nuances of emotion. And sometimes a starting point for this can be to go more into the body and to notice different sensations and kind of start to be like curious and compassionate about what those sensations might mean and what emotions might be going on there. Obviously as well, if you are neurodiverse, some of this as well may be more challenging because sometimes again, that kind of connection with the body is sometimes um, even more sort of, you know, sort of cut off. So it, it might be something that you need to work with, with a therapist to get more support if needed. So once we start to tune into our emotions, we are then in touch with that internal barometer that can really guide us, which can tell us, you know, how are we feeling in response to things that are going on in our world? You know, because our emotions are there for a reason. If we feel angry, probably someone has crossed a boundary or, you know, something has upset us maybe. If we're feeling sad, maybe we have lost something. Um, maybe there's been a rupture in a relationship. If we're feeling anxious, we're probably fearful about something. So there's so many different ways that our emotions can tell us about how, you know, you'd be a really important guide. And um, if we are not tuning into our emotions, we're missing something that is so, so, so important. And we're missing that vital bit of information. So sometimes in eating disorder recovery, it can feel very, very challenging when you are firstly more in touch with your emotions because you might feel that you've been cut off from them for so long and then suddenly 
you're almost being overwhelmed with them and it can feel a bit like kind of tidal waves of feeling after being so cut off. But this is usually a sort of temporary thing as well. You know, like if you have blocked your emotions for a long time, it's understandable that almost there's a volcano of emotion sometimes that needs to be, um, needs to erupt almost to be able to kind of clear some of those emotions away. But actually this is a really healthy, normal part of the process. And it's completely okay that things might feel a bit worse before they feel better. But that's okay because the wonderful thing is as well is that once you're more in tune with your emotions, it means a whole range of emotions because when you try and cut off from your negative emotions, you also cut off from your more positive ones too. So actually being more in touch with your emotional world, you're going to be feeling more peace, more contentment, more joy, more excitement, more happiness, more all the good stuff as well, which is incredibly helpful. And as part of all of this as well, you start to improve your emotional intelligence because when you're in touch with your emotions, you're able to kind of communicate with other people in your life, how you're feeling. That improves the depth of your relationships and your communication. And all round, it's gonna lead you to just experiencing more joy, more intimacy and closeness with others, which ultimately as humans is really what we're all looking for. Okay, number six is developing self-compassion. Now, many people are resistant to being compassionate towards themselves because they often feel that by being critical, by telling themselves off, that somehow they're gonna really motivate themselves and somehow they're gonna achieve great results. Now, for most of us actually, having a very critical inner voice being criticized and berated and told how we are not doing well at things is generally not very motivating. And if you think about how you would motivate a child to achieve something, say for example, they're learning to ride a bike, you would be very supportive and encouraging and warm and uplifting. And if they fell off, you would just encourage them to get back on and to repeat the whole process. And you would not be judging them for falling off. You would be offering them you know, so much support. So I think what's really important to recognize is being compassionate towards ourselves as well does not mean giving up on our goals. Because I think sometimes people think if I'm compassionate towards myself, it means I'm gonna sit on the sofa all day, I'm never gonna achieve anything or do anything, and my life's gonna be really sort of underwhelming. And actually we're not meaning that because actually you can still achieve your goals, you can still have big hopes and dreams, you can still go a long way in life by being compassionate and supportive towards yourself. So when we work on self-compassion as well, we understand about our emotional regulation systems, how sometimes we can get very caught as humans in spending a lot of time in the fight flight system where we are being driven by our adrenaline and cortisol and you know we are fleeing the bear that often isn't there, but we're kind of living in that state of stress. We need the fight flight system because you know if your house caught fire, you would not want to be sitting there chilling out but actually we don't want to be in fight flight consistently because that's not very helpful. We also have the striving system. The striving system is the one that gives us that big release of dopamine. It gives us hope and purpose. It means that we get up in the morning, we do our to-do list. We have a whole load of things that we can do which bring us a sense of purpose and achievement and meaning. So as humans, we really need that system because without it, we would probably be a bit underwhelmed and a bit bored. But if you are too much in the striving system, you often get burnout and feel that you lose the joy in the things that used to bring you joy. So for example, anyone that has worked too many hours, even at a job they love, they often get to the place where actually that job doesn't bring them the joy anymore. Actually, they start to really resent it. So when we're becoming more self-compassionate, we really um, are appreciating as well the self-soothing system. So we've got the fight flight, We've got the striving system, but we also have the self-soothing system. The self-soothing system is the place where we can rest, where we can recharge, where we can play, where we can relax, where we can restore ourselves. And most human beings don't spend enough time in the soothing system. And if you have an eating disorder, you will often be relying on food or exercise as a maladaptive way to self-soothe. So becoming more self-compassionate is about really integrating self-soothing into the balance of things. So yes, sometimes you might still be in the fight flight system. Yes, you're still going to be striving sometimes and achieving and doing all your goals, etc. 
but actually you want the balance, you want to be in the self-soothing system as well, having that rest and downtime. And also it can be helpful when we're looking at becoming self-compassionate to look at Kristen Neff's work as well. And she talks about, you know, becoming much kinder to ourselves through our actions, through our words, through our thoughts, you know, treating ourselves as we would a good friend or a child or a pet. She talks as well about our shared humanity, realizing that whatever you're going through in this moment, someone else will be going through this or will have gone through it before. Because sometimes as humans, when we're struggling, we feel very isolated and alone. When in fact, humans go through universal experiences. Many humans every day are experiencing the emotions you are experiencing today. And sometimes it's helpful to remember that and to remember that we are all connected. Because in the moment of struggle, It can feel that there's something wrong with you personally and you can feel very, very alone. And then Christian Neff also talks about being, becoming mindful, coming into that kind of present moment, really actually kind of being much more aware of your thoughts, not living constantly in the future or constantly in the past, but actually being in the present. And I think the whole, as I've said on the podcast before, the whole kind of romanticizing your life and being very intentional and really trying to slow down each moment and create moments of meaning and connection and really feeling all of those five senses in the moment can make things really, really helpful. So when we access the self-soothing system as well, we can think about activating the five senses. And everyone is slightly different in terms of how they will sort of um, experience self-soothing. So some people are much more kind of visual maybe, so they might like find a walk in nature and being able to kind of see things around them that makes them feel very soothed. Other people might listen to bird song or um, listen to music maybe or meditation or something. Someone else might have um, like, a t- like use taste maybe through like a really soothing cup of tea. And it could be through touch as well, through maybe like a really soft, cozy blanket, sitting on the sofa, curling up, watching your favourite film or something like that. Okay, time for a short advertisement break. So I know we talk a lot about food freedom on this podcast and how important it is to take care of yourself mentally and physically as you learn to navigate a culture inundated with toxic messaging. One of the best ways to take care of yourself is through exercise. But I know it can be really hard to find an exercise program that isn't rooted in these toxic messages and doesn't feel triggering. Well, I recently met Katie, the owner of an amazing new exercise company called We Shape. We Shape doesn't focus on calorie counting, tracking how much you work out or making you feel bad about your body to get you motivated. Instead, they create a customized exercise routine for you that helps you connect with and care for your body rather than feeling pressure to change it. They help you learn to set intentions that come from a place of self-care rather than self-judgment. And they support you every step of the way with an amazing community and live coaching so you can make exercise a self-care practice that helps you feel better in your body and about your body. Plus, they're going to give listeners of the show the chance to try it out for two full weeks for free. Just head on over to www.weshape.com forward slash freedom or check out the link in the show notes to get started today. Number seven, reintroducing your old forbidden foods. So when you have an eating disorder, foods will often be seen as good or bad and your judgment around your eating may have become extreme. Now I know as well with wellness culture, we can often label foods as well in terms of clean, unclean, all of the things. So although this feels a way of exerting some control around food, in reality, it often exacerbates binging or overeating behaviors. So it's really helpful, I believe, and I know not everyone shares the same approach, but to be able to kind of find food neutrality and some peace with food. And this involves really gradually and slowly reintroducing your old forbidden foods so you're taking them off the pedestal and they're not being so special anymore because I think the tricky thing is if you try to avoid these foods if you try to keep the white carbs or the sugar or whatever it is for you out of the house these foods become the the foods that you dream about they become really seductive they become so special and heightened and full of excitement and naughty foods etc etc Whereas actually when we really allow them in, when we give ourselves permission to eat them, we start to realize actually 
they're nice, but they're not so special. You know, they, we take them off the pedestal. We have much more food neutrality. But I think this process takes time. If you have been massively restrictive with your eating and you've had so many food rules, you can't suddenly overnight say, right, no more food rules for me. I'm just gonna allow everything in. I mean, you can do that, but often for most people, it is quite overwhelming. So the way to deal with this is to really gradually permit in foods one at a time almost. So you can do it by gaining a sense of control and feeling some efficacy really over your ability to manage these foods. Because of once you start to develop some momentum in being able to manage these foods and be able to manage portion sizes and to exert some control around your eating of these foods, it just helps you build more confidence and these foods become less exciting, less emotionally charged, and you will gradually move towards a more peaceful place. So sometimes to begin with, you may literally have to have your forbidden food outside of the house, maybe you have to do it with a friend, maybe you have to organize distraction afterwards, maybe you have to really actively work on your thinking, you know, just really see this as inoculation against binge eating, really give yourself full permission when the guilt etc comes up after eating you always have to be very prepared to deal with that and to be kind of ready to deal with your thoughts in a different way so this can feel really really challenging but if you think of this again as the long game and you think about reintroducing a new food even one a week or one every two weeks for the next year just think of the difference that's going to make and often for people as well is once they introduce one thing it can allow something similar to also be introduced so it's not that you're going to have to like take the next 10 years to slowly reintroduce everything that's been forbidden you know it's going to be a faster process than that but it's probably best to think about the long game and think about a year because of just think how many new foods you could reintroduce over the next year and how much more peaceful you could feel when you're not attaching all this judgment to these foods okay number eight is dealing with our thoughts so as you're aware, if you listen to this podcast, we have 60,000 plus thoughts a day. Many of those thoughts are repetitive. Some of those thoughts are negative automatic thoughts. We can also call them hot thoughts. And these are thoughts that are often emotionally charged and we have a lot of stories attached to them and they can be quite distorted ways of looking at things. So common distorted thinking patterns for someone with an eating disorder is for example, when they break a dietary rule, so if the dietary rule is I must eat X number of calories per day, they then eat 200 calories over their limit for the day and then their interpretation of that event through their thinking is something like, oh my goodness, I've completely blown it now, so I might as well binge and eat everything in sight. So you can see really like the extra 200 calories or whatever is not really the problem, but the thinking around the eating is the problem because actually we are thinking about that eating experience in quite a catastrophic way. If you're thinking in your head a thought like, I've completely blown it, I might as well just eat everything in sight, well, you're probably gonna go on and then feel really guilty and anxious. You're probably going to eat everything in sight. You're gonna feel even worse. You're gonna have lots of negative thoughts coming from that and it's, a horrible cycle to be in. Another one that is commonly experienced with people with eating disorders is catastrophization, and it's when we get into a place of fear, which we are very naturally programmed to do and be as humans. You know, we are quite fearful, and this has probably helped us survive, but actually, often we are fearful of things that we don't need to be fearful about. You know, when we're catastrophizing, we're almost anticipating that there's a bear in the hedge that's just about to eat you. And actually, in most cases, there is not a bear there at all. So it's starting to realize actually that often when you're catastrophizing, you're thinking of the absolute worst case scenario. You're anticipating that everything is gonna go completely horribly wrong and that you're gonna have no resources or ability to deal with the situation. So I think we can do this as humans so easily, but I think as well, if you have an eating disorder, you can really catastrophize not only around food and body image issues, but also around lots of other things as well. And then often this will lead you back to using restriction or binging or over-exercise as a way to kind of try and escape those difficult thoughts. So becoming more aware of your thoughts is really, really helpful because of when we are not aware of our thoughts, it's almost like we're completely lost in the jungle. We have no map 
we don't know what's going on, we're completely unconscious, and before we can even change our thoughts, we have to bring them into our awareness and to start to kind of name them and recognize how we are thinking. So a big piece of the therapy is starting to identify some of these thoughts and then starting to you know, look at these thoughts with curiosity and compassion and to really sort of think about, are these thoughts true? Because we often assume that our thoughts are facts and our thoughts are not facts. <laughs> a lot of our thoughts are not facts at all and actually we feel that they are true and it's because of maybe an early event that's happened to us they're often tied to early events in our life where there's a lot of emotion attached and the thought has become very very true but in fact it is not true at all so it can be really helpful to start to untangle some of these thoughts to think about actually what would i say to a friend who is thinking this how would i like to be thinking about this What's the evidence for this? What's the evidence against this? So start to kind of, it's not about just being really sort of super positive, toxically positive, just try and gloss over everything. It's trying to look at your thoughts in a much more objective way and to start to realize actually, maybe these thoughts aren't facts. And often clients find that with thought challenging, some thoughts are very, very challenging to shift. And this is because we have thought about things in a certain way for a very long time, and this has almost formed kind of deeper beliefs about how we view the world. Um, so sometimes we need to go deeper and really sort of challenge those beliefs. And that sometimes can be sort of like harder work because of what we tend to do as humans is we go through life with our confirmation bias. If we believe a certain thing, so say for example, if you believe that um, people generally don't like you, okay? This means that when you turn up to any social event, you're gonna be hyper vigilant for any evidence of someone not liking you. So if someone doesn't make eye contact with you, if someone has got a bit of a grumpy face, you will interpret that through the lens of, you know, this just means I'm unlikable. So you're kind of collecting this evidence with that confirmation bias all the time. Whereas someone actually who, genuinely believes I'm a likable person, I get on well with people. If they turn up to an event and someone doesn't give them eye contact or someone's got a grumpy face, they will just interpret that as, well, that person's probably having a bad day, that has nothing to do with me, or they may not even notice it in the first place. So we can start to realize in a way that as human beings, we are all a bit crazy in a way with our thoughts. We all have a slightly distorted view of reality based on what we have lived through in our life, all our different projections, all the different experiences we have been through, who has a really accurate view of reality, to be honest with you. But by having a different relationship towards our thoughts, it puts us in a powerful place for change. Number nine, developing a healthy body image. So if you've got an eating disorder, your body image is likely to be pretty negative and your worth will be very tied up with how your body looks or the number on the scales. Now, this is really, really hard to win at because of usually you will never be good enough for your eating disorder. So even if you started off thinking, oh, well, if I just lose a few pounds, then I'll be happier, then I'll stop dieting, then all will be well. What tends to happen is you then reach the said milestone that you had set for yourself, you get there and you just think, oh, I just lose a bit more, then I'll be really happy. And yeah, it's tricky. It's hard to, it's so, so, so hard to win. So one of the things is really starting to separate self-worth from the body. That is hard. I think research has shown that up to a third of our self-worth in Western culture is related to body image. You know, we live in a very kind of body image, appearance, weight related, obsessed society. Okay, but we can begin to step away from this a bit more and to dilute it. And we can start to look at things like body neutrality, you know, starting to appreciate more what the body can do rather than just appreciating your body for how it looks. We can do like thought challenging around body image. We can look at your use of mirrors and your use of the weighing scales. You know, if you are starting your day, starting your day every day by getting on the weighing scales and attaching whether it's gonna be a good or a bad day to that number, you can see how that's not really gonna set you off on a very enlightened day path, is it? It's gonna really interfere with how you feel about yourself. If you're constantly body checking and looking in the mirror all the time, again, that is not gonna be helpful. So you can start to notice in a way all the different triggers in your day which are sort of perpetuating that negative body image. Maybe as well you're comparing yourself with others, maybe you're following people on social media who are really activating for you. I know 
many people I work with have actually kind of done a good old detox of their social media, but they might often still be following one or two people who are really, really triggering. So it's important to really go into the detail here. Often as well, what's really helpful with improving body image is just simply focusing less on the body. Now that sounds simple, but it is hard. But if you think back to maybe a time in your life where you didn't have an eating disorder, and I I appreciate that's not gonna be true for everyone listening, but for some people listening, you will be able to think back to a time in your life where you were more body neutral, where you just had a relationship with your body, where it was just something that got you from A to B, where you weren't sort of chastising it, poking it, prodding it, judging it, etc. It was just a vessel that moved you through life. And if you think back to that time as well, you're probably so much more focused on your friendships, what you were doing, activities, adventure, play, etc. You weren't so focused on your body. So a big healing part of having a better relationship with your body is just focusing less on it. Because of we know in a way the more you focus on your body, the less satisfied you're gonna feel with it. You know, people that do those bodybuilder competitions, et cetera, often get really obsessed with their body. They become so fixated on all the little details, on the symmetry of muscles, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really, really hard to feel good when you might think, well, surely someone going down that path where they are obtaining a, a body that is supposedly, you know, very desirable, surely they're going to feel better. So number 10, finding your voice and developing assertiveness skills. Now many people with eating disorders tend to veer a bit towards being people pleasers. Again, I'm generalizing here, not true for everybody, but by not having an assertive voice, by often saying yes to things that actually would like to say no to, being very conditioned as showing up as the perfect pleasing person in life, often your own needs and emotions and everything get overlooked. And then this tends to bubble up and get lived out through your eating disorder behaviors. So say for example, if you're not having a voice, you're gonna feel very resentful, angry, even if this is quite unconscious to you. Now, I think for many people with eating disorders, they feel really bad if they feel angry or upset or you know, dissatisfied or disappointed with someone who's close to them because they feel like I'm a bad person for having those feelings. They tend to push them down consciously or unconsciously. And then they will use disordered eating behaviors like restriction or binging or purging or over-exercise as a way to try and escape those emotions and try and numb and distract from them. So a huge part of eating disorder recovery is about finding your voice, starting to give yourself permission to actually tap into your own thoughts and feelings and desires and to learn to be able to express those in your relationships because of so often we are sort of pushing things down, we're tolerating things in relationships that are not really healthy for us and then the eating disorder becomes a way to survive and cope in those relationships which of course is not healthy. So finding your voice and developing assertiveness skills can be a really, really helpful way to be addressing all of this. Number 11, discovering new ways to boost your self-esteem and self-worth. Now, for most people underneath an eating disorder, they don't feel good enough. Now, this is often rooted in different early experiences, different things that have happened to you. Okay, so it's really important to begin to develop a better and solid sense of self-worth, to be able to recognize your strengths and attributes, to be able to start to back yourself, to be able to have boundaries in place, to be able to really appreciate the things that you bring to the world, the things that you bring to your relationships. And this isn't about being arrogant or self-centered, it's about being able to quietly acknowledge your strengths rather than constantly berating yourself, beating yourself up, not feeling good enough, and then trying to kind of chase that feeling of good enough by losing weight, chasing a number on the scales, controlling your food, etc., etc. Because actually, even if you follow the perfect diet, even if you lost the weight, if you got to the number that you think is going to be the fancy number that makes everything fine, it's not going to bring you that solid sense of self-worth that diet culture promises you. It really isn't. The way we build a solid sense of self-worth is by really stepping into our own personal strengths, our own personal power, by finding our voice, by backing ourselves and surrounding ourselves as well with people who really can accept us, where we can feel fully seen and heard and validated. So this is such an important part, piece of the puzzle. And number 12 is managing relapse. 
So lapses, blips are all part of the recovery process. It is very normal that your motivation will fluctuate. Recovery is not linear. It's not a lovely smooth process of how I wish it was. When you have a blip or a lapse, you are not back to square one. You are just going through the normal recovery process and it is often one step forward and two steps back. And this is absolutely okay. So it's about developing a different relationship towards relapse. So you can be much more compassionate and kind with yourself. But you can see every little lapse as a learning experience, something that you can really benefit from something that you can learn from, something that you can have a lot of curiosity and compassion towards so that you can then know what your big triggers are, that you can be sort of forewarned and you can set yourself up knowing how to navigate all of this. And for everybody, they will have their vulnerable spots and things that make them vulnerable to lapses and that's okay. But actually, if we can really reframe lapsing as a normal part of the process of something that is just you know to be expected and to go with the flow of it and to realize that we are not back to square one that we don't need to kind of give up and just think recovery is not for me but actually we can just embrace the imperfection of it and go with it okay goodness me i thought this was going to be a shorter episode but it's actually quite long so i hope i haven't overwhelmed you all there So that really gives an insight really of different ways that you can work on recovery, lots of different kind of sections there. So of course it's not just limited to these 12 things. So, you know, I think it's really important to say that we all have our own recovery road as well. And these are just some of the areas and areas that I often particularly focus on when I work with my clients. These are areas that I have focused on a lot in my own recovery, but it's not the same for everyone. So I think Again, don't feel limited by this, you know, take what is helpful, don't take what is unhelpful. And if there are other things that you would really include, also just let me know, I would be very intrigued to hear about this because I think there are many, many things that help people on the recovery road and there are definitely more than 12. (laughs) So if you might be interested in my bulimia or my binge eating course and you wanna go on the waiting list, do drop me an email, harriet.fru at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram and I can put you on the waiting list and when the courses do go live, I can give you a nice super duper discount. And yeah, that would just be hopefully really helpful and you would appreciate that. So if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. For further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.